Welcome to the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame show. We're here today with our special guest, Homer Rice. Homer is one of the most remarkable and most rewarding careers in the history of American sports. Welcome, Homer. Before we get into your illustrious sports career, would you like to tell us about your personal life growing up in Fort Thomas area, the younger years? Joe, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was actually born in Bellevue, Kentucky. My dad was a Methodist minister. And we were there, we moved to Louisville a short time, and then to Pineville, Kentucky. And that's where I decided I wanted to be a football coach. I was only eight years old, perhaps. And, uh, I was the mascot of the, of the high school team where my older brother was a star player. And Walter Grabick, he was an All-American quarterback at Center College in 1930. He was the coach. And he impressed me so much that I decided I wanted to be a football coach. So that's how it all started. And, and then you keep moved up into northern Kentucky? And we moved to Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and that's where I went to high school. And uh, Coach Waddell, you, Judge Waddell, was a coach, and we came to Highlands that same year, 1942. Uh, they had a rule then, Joe, that you couldn't compete until after you'd been there a semester. And so I uh, th was able to practice, but uh, the next year I was, was a player, and, and that year we were state champions, 1943. And what position did you play? I was a quarterback. And quarterback. The next year I was a captain and, and had some all-state honors and things like that. But uh, we always had good players, and that was important. Yeah. Uh, your <clears> personal <throat> life, you've been married uh, for 64 years until your wife passed away last year. Yes, we were married in her 64th year. and. Uh, she passed away last November, and and uh, we, I, as, we, I lived in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, after Pineville, short this time, and uh, in this seventh grade, I saw this beautiful, cute little girl, and I told, went home and told my mother, I found the girl I'm going to marry. She <laughs> said, well, Homer, you're only 12 years old. I said, I don't care. I'm going to be playing football, and I won't have time to look around. So <laughs> that's how it all started. <laughs> yeah, how many children do you have? We have three daughters. Uh, seven grandkids and three and almost four great grand great grandchildren. Are any of them still living around here? Uh, no, they're not in no. this area. Oh, they're, they're out away from the area. Yeah. They're. Okay. And then when you went to Highlands, uh, you played football. When you got out, did you get a scholarship to college? Or well, first of all, I uh, had a scholarship and signed actually with Georgia Tech. Bobby Dotted called. It's going to be his first year. And Ray Ellis, assistant, who had been a high school coach in Kentucky, Western Kentucky, uh, was, was a coach who came up and actually signed me. But two weeks later, I was called by the United States Navy. This is uh, November, late November, in early December. So I was off to Great Lakes Naval Station, and just a month or so later, I'm in the South Pacific on a ship during World War Number Two. Yeah. So a lot of the players later on in the 50s, not when they went into service, they played on the football teams and that, but that yeah. wasn't your case. I, you were, I didn't know about those at that yeah, time. You were, I'd been somewhere playing football. Yeah, yeah, you were just, but I went on to college after that at Center College. And, and it's an uh, interesting time because we're on a quarter system, and I'd sign a, a baseball contract with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Frank Ricky, Branch Ricky's brother, signed me after an all-star game. And, and so in the spring, I'd go away to camp, but I told them I was going to stay in school and graduate. <clears throat> and while I was there, I was playing football, and I had some All-American honors. But uh, that was the uh, that was unusual in those days to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. Usually the pro teams wouldn't mess with you if you were in college. You either had to get out or play. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, at one time, uh, you have a picture uh, that in one of the minor league camps where you were with the Brooklyn Dodgers, yes. and you were a catcher, though. I was a catcher. And you were unfortunate to run across a guy named Roy Campanella. Yes, yeah, so when he came to camp, I knew my days were numbered. I, <laughs> you started I, looking I, for a new career. I, I, looking for a new career, that's right. <laughs> that was a Jackie Robinson time when he broke in at the same time, and that was, I knew him and uh, such an outstanding individual, and it was a different time, of course. And, yeah. And it really started something in our entire nation. Yeah. Well, they must have thought, the Dodger organization must have thought highly of you to let you stay in school and then report when right. school was over. Well, I think Frank Rickey was the reason. He, uh, he could see that I was definitely wanting to stay in college and finish and earn a degree. And uh, he said, that's fine. We'll find a place for you to play each summer. And then when you finish college, we'll 
We'll talk about coming to the Ebbetsville. Yeah, but then when you went on back to college and then you came back to Highlands? Well, not at, not at first. I uh, took a job at Wartburg, Tennessee. I, I wanted to be a head coach and uh, I fell aside, just married, and I had a lot of good assistant jobs offered in college and in high school, but uh, I wanted to be a head coach. And so uh, I had a letter from Wartburg, Tennessee, a head coaching job, and I signed up for it and got it. And I went there. I was the coach of every sport. I was the only coach. So <laughs> that was my head coaching job. An interesting happened there, Joe. Uh, I didn't have enough uniforms for my players. <clears throat> and there was a prison nearby. And my one of my players' father was a warden. And he said, I bet my dad would let you have some of their equipment. They used to have football there. So I went out there to the prison. He says, I'll let you have the equipment if you'll coach our prison team, too. <laughs> And so I did that, that so I could, I did that at six o'clock in the morning. And by the way, that team was undefeated as well as the high school team was undefeated. Uh, the only coach in history to coach two teams the same season, both of them undefeated. Yeah. But I tell the story about my prison team. Uh, we'd won three games, we're playing our fourth game and uh, they were way ahead of us. And, uh, but they got in a big fight and we had to cancel the game and so I didn't have to count that as a loss. So that, that was the undefeated team. It was a good job that we had all home games and yeah. didn't have to worry about alumni coming back on me or anything. And, and you didn't have to worry about bed check the night before or anything, did you? They, they were well taken care of. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, that was your first college head coaching job. Then well, that was my first high school job. High school job. I went on to Spring City, Tennessee for two years, and those three years were undefeated years. And then my coach, uh, Waddell, that I played for, became the superintendent at Highlands, at the, this four-time of schools, mm -hmm. and he asked me to come and replace him. And I came to the Fort Thomas in 1954. Okay, what was your record the first year there? Well, I think we... I only lost two games, but we tied four, and we won about four. So it's 4-2-4 four, four the first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, basically, through the grapevine rumor mill, you were accredited with actually uh, being the one to start the summer physical fitness programs, and that the college continues through today. But you were the one that implemented it, is that correct? That's right. We were one of the first. We called it the 60-minute club, and we did that after this football season during the winter. and. Uh, <clears throat> Our kids, uh, I think the reason we were successful, we were in such great shape. They could play a game and not even Burt Wicker would sweat sometimes. And, and I think that was a key to our physical part. And of course, I thought quite a bit and did a look quite a bit on the mental part. Yeah. Yeah, you still have that today. You take teams like, well, I just watched that Auburn game the other night, Kansas State, and they made some, uh, Kansas State made some errors kept them from winning, really. That's right. Yes. But Auburn, though, you could see as the game got to the third and the fourth quarter, it looked like Auburn, the speed of their no huddle and that, yes. that they were in better shape. And you could see that Kansas State wasn't going to catch up with them. That's right. Our teams were had speed, quickness, endurance. And uh, and one thing, we ne never take their hit gears off. And they never kneeled down. And they stood up mm -hmm. during timeout periods or whatever. And we, we always had a thing where we when we changed ends of the field, that that our team would beat the other team there. And we'd run down there, the other team would be straggling, have their head gears off, and our kids would say, we got them. We yeah, got them. and ready to yeah. go. You also st stress the academic part. Exactly, of the that's too. always, uh, as, as I went on, I developed a total person program, I called it, for our student athletes in colleges as well as high schools. Hmm. And uh, 19, 57, that's your trophy, uh, Coach of the Year, Homer Rice, Kentucky High School uh, Association. That was, your, I guess, your first major award? That was. Uh, that's, uh, we're going to have the, uh, a little ceremony for that group now. 1957 was a very good football team, and, uh, and we won the state title. We actually claimed it. That was before the official state championship and the playoffs began. And so that was my first state championship team. Yeah. But <clears throat> as outside of your football, like you were a pretty good baseball player too. But uh, well, I played with the Dodgers, and uh, and uh, of course I stopped playing when I became coaching. Yeah. And uh, but uh, I did coach uh, baseball at Highlands. Well, as that's well. what I was going to ask you. Yes. You, you also coached the baseball teams at Highlands. I did. And but we were 
We were pretty good. We won this conference here, and we played at state a couple of times and that type of thing. Yeah, but you coached both sports at Highlands. Yes, I did. Yeah, and uh, that's one of the things now where it's hard to do because most of your coaches are just one sports now. Yeah. I remember Tom Ellis, I used to, he was a whole thing, football, basketball, baseball, you know. That's right. And yeah. the, the good news was that once you're on a good side, you could play all three sports. But That's if you right. got on the bad side, you were out. You, you couldn't right. play anything. <laughs> That's right. You had to play them all. That's yeah. Right. yeah. So they're getting ready to uh, get ready to take a break. Before we do real quick, Golden Gloves. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, my older brother and his friend decided I was tough enough to get in the Golden Gloves and <clears throat> as a boxer. And um, uh, I didn't really know anything about boxing, but I had quickness. And uh, so they, they got, got to train me and, and put me in the 12-year-old up uh, as a lightweight. And I was only 11 years old. I don't know how I got into it, but I went on and won all the way to Louisville and went in the state. And uh, I retired right after that yeah. as, as a champion. Yeah, you, you, you won the left. I won. <laughs> you kept yes. your good looks. Yes. Okay, well, Homer, they're getting ready to give us a sign for a break. So we'll return in a few moments, uh, and we'll get into your further career as a literature, writing, articles, etc. And we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you. Hey, Cam, thanks a lot for coming to my school today. Don't forget 60 minutes of play a day, right? And I'll grow up to be big and strong like you. Absolutely. And play in the NFL. Yes, sir. And become the starting quarterback of the Panthers. <laughs> okay. And become your mom's favorite player. Whoa. I'm just messing with you. Oh. Or am I? Welcome back to the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame show today with our special guest, Homer Rice. Homer, we talked about your Highlands career, then you went into college. Was University of Kentucky your first uh, college? University of Kentucky, um, actually in 1957, I had Blanton Collier come and speak to your players at the banquet and, uh, and he offered me a job then at Kentucky. And uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't accept that. And later on, when he finished the banquet and saw our kids, he said, I can see why you decided to stay here. But uh, in 1961, after our third championship, uh, uh, the, they called me at Kentucky. Lan Collier is leaving. He went back to Cleveland and the world champions there in a couple of years. But uh, I, they wanted me, asked me about the hit job, and I actually did not feel good about that and decided not to pursue it. And then uh, they asked me if I'd be the be their top assistant and and work with the offense. And but as time went on, I did that. And we last couple of years, we were there four years. We were the top offensive team in the nation, Southeastern Conference. And Rick Norton, my first uh, college quarterback, was All American. And um, and so we had we had good some good feelings there. And that took me on to Oklahoma. I'd been offered. Uh, a head job at Duke and uh, Citadel and other places, but decided to go to Oklahoma. It was a great football place, and, and the same thing there. We were the top team in the Big Eight Conference uh, offensively, and Bobby Warmack, my All-American quarterback there. And from there, I was I came back to the University of Cincinnati, and I had a chance to accept the head job at Oklahoma, uh, but uh, I decided to stay at UC and. Uh, Ended up with Greg Cook and Bobby, uh, rather uh, uh, O'Brien, Jimmy O'Brien, and some of those players. That we had a great game against Miami when Bo Schembacher was coaching in Miami. We won the game in the last four minutes, last three seconds, 23 to 21, and there were some great games. And and uh, of course, I, I coached at Rice University. Had Tommy Kramer. We were the national best offensive team in the nation. And uh, and then I came to the Bengals. Paul Brown. I had met at the uh, Interstein, I met him and Blanton Collier at Great Lakes as I entered the Navy because I was played briefly with the uh, with the baseball team at Great Lakes uh, 
Bob Feller, who came back from the war, he'd been a pilot, and he was our manager, and, and I did get to catch him briefly, so he was probably the fastest. They clocked him over 100 miles an hour, yeah. so he was a great one, but uh, that's kind of my, my college coaching career. Yeah. Uh, touching back on some of the stories, at Oklahoma, who took the head coaching job when you turned it down? Well, uh, Jim McKenzie was the head coach that, that hired me to be the offensive quarter, and he passed away just as I left for UC. Mm -hmm. And they called me and they said, I have to, we have to have an answer right now. Well, I had all the coaches or families, I couldn't, I couldn't turn, it, turn them down, yeah. so I had to let it go. Yeah, but who eventually got the Oklahoma job? Well, Chuck Fairbanks, who, uh, when I left there, he was the defensive backfield coach, and they moved him to my position uh, on the offense. And he, st he stayed there pretty long, didn't he? He did, and then Barry Switzer, who was my offensive line coach, yeah. became the head coach. Yeah, yeah they, they had good teams all through yes, that period. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Uh, getting back to UC, uh, Greg Cook, I remember seeing some of the UC games, and at the time, I thought he was one of the best passers in college football. And then the first year he played with the Bengals, he was really good until he got injured. Uh, yes. What was your professional opinion of him? Well, uh, Greg uh, needed a little touch-up at the beginning, and, uh, but he learned to throw the long arc, the long pass. And Jim O'Brien and other receivers, what, if you could get one step on your defender, then he could put it up so you could run under it and catch mm -hmm. it for a touchdown. And we scored yeah. several touchdowns. I know Jimmy O'Brien had like 13 yeah. touchdowns that way. He had the greatest touch of the long pass. Yeah. He could throw the football 70 yards. Yeah. That's what I remember most about him was the deep passes. Like you said, he'd have a step on a guy yes. and the ball would be like a rainbow coming out right. of the sky and it hit the guys right in stride. We never called that interesting. It, it was always a... We'd break the route if he, the, the receiver, we had a signal. If he could beat the defender, he, he gave a signal to the quarterback and he pumped the ball and then put it back up. Yeah. Yes. If not, he'd start to stop short and come back to That's the right. ball. Yeah, and they yes. throw it in there, yeah. Yeah, that was a shame that he got hurt as early it as was. he did. He was injured in, uh, his, after his rookie year at yeah. the end of it. And, uh, uh -huh. He was, the, of course, the rookie of the year. Yeah. I think I forget who it was. I think it came, I think it was Kansas. It was had a real good team then, and he beat them in his first yes, game. Yes, he hurt his shoulder. And it, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and it, 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 they had a good ball club then. Yes, they did. So, but then you coached the Bengals. Tell us some Bengals stories here. Well, there's a lot of, a lot of stories there. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think that the best thing about that is uh, uh, the Steelers, of course, were the best team in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. And they'd won three world championships, and they're on the fourth one, which they actually won. But uh, I sent uh, a quarterback home with the films, uh, the, all the films of the Steelers games. And uh, he uh, studied that all summer. And he came back, and we had a play for every defense they lined up in. They, they had these, all these blitzes. And they were the Iron Court Curtain. And uh, we had a uh, had a checkoff for each one that they lined up in, and we hit six big plays on them, and that was a game. I remember Archie Griffin, who was a running back, he could sneak down and get there in the middle, and we'd hit him for some big plays. And yeah. So it was a, a yeah, great a, game. And yeah, we won the game 34. We had them down four, 34 to three, and they scored on the last play of the game, <clears throat> and uh, and that was a. That was a big upset. Yeah, yeah. Archie Griffin was from Ohio State. Yes. Yeah, he's a uh, great individual. Yeah, great. Who was the quarterback? You mentioned the quarterback. Well, I'm trying to think of his name right now. <laughs> Wasn't Virgil Carter? No, no. Yeah, Who was it, John? I didn't hear the question. The quarterback at the Bengals, I coach. Uh, Anderson. Yeah, oh, Kenny Anderson. Anderson. Oh, yes, yeah. Kenny, uh, Anderson. Yeah, Kenny Anderson was our quarterback. Yeah. He. Uh, uh, when I got to him, I think the big thing is I helped him get really get in shape. Yeah. And uh, he had a great year and came back later and we went to, the Bengals went to the Super Bowl. And yeah. We didn't win it, but he was there. Yeah. Yeah, Kenny was a good quarterback. Yes. Yeah, and he still lives in this area. I think he still lives out around Crestville. Does he? Yeah, fine person. Yeah. Yeah, he was there for years. And, and In fact, I saw something just last week where him and his wife were having some kind of a charity function. And that's around here, but yeah, Kenny was a good guy. But uh, 
mostly the knock on him from local people was uh, the short passes. Yeah. He's only throw five, ten yard passes at the backs and that. Yeah. But like Greg Cook could go downfield. You yeah. didn't see that too much with, That's the, right. with Anderson. Yeah. But again, that was a coaching philosophy, right. not more than him. Exactly. But Kenny was a good. A lot of people think that he should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, well, yeah. Isaac Curtis was a, our best receiver, one mm -hmm. of our best receivers in. And we we had a couple in there where he could break a route and go, and he yeah. did he did well with that. Yeah, yeah. Isaac was a great receiver. Was Trumpy playing then? No, he was he, he was a radio man by then. He was a radio. That yeah. was, was before he was yes. there before you were there. Yes, he was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then when you left UC or the Bengals, then you went to well, uh, I I went into the administration, North Carolina, director of athletics. Interesting thing is I never applied for after I. Applied for my first coaching job at Wartburg, Tennessee. Uh, I never applied for another job. And they, they just came. And so in North Carolina, I actually had turned them down from Oklahoma to be their head coach football. And then later on, they, they invited me to be the director of athletics. And I was there eight years. We had 72 and 73. We had the best program in the country. And then going to Georgia Tech, they were down, way down. Uh, in fact, I remember Bobby Dodd called me and said, you have to come, they're going to drop football. <laughs> it was talked about, it was so, so devastating at the time. But we, again, I was fortunate to have good people, to hire good people. And uh, we ended up being in the Final Four in basketball and we uh, had the national championship in football and our track and Olympic people that went won and our golf and and the tennis and other programs were runners up. In baseball, we were in the College World Series the first time in history and went to the final game. And so everything developed there. And the biggest thing that developed there was a student athlete total person program. And this is something that I put together. My father gave me a book when I was 12 years old <coughs> entitled I Dare You by William Danforth. It was a book that challenged, this is 1939. This challenged you to set your goals in every aspect of your life. And uh, I did that, and that's what really brought me into writing and interested in that field and setting goals. And they all came true, so I was, I was a believer early on. Yeah, I know you don't like to tout your own horn, but if I remember correctly, when you went to Georgia Tech, uh, most football programs support other programs in the school like golf, yes. swimming, yes. the non-revenue producing sports. And I, if I remember reading from the papers and that at the time, the sports magazines, like Georgia Tech was threatening to do away with a lot of the non-producing sports, golf, women's golf, tennis, swimming, stuff like that. And within five years, not only did you save the sports, but you all had them that they were in the top echelons of the conference. Right, we were, we were winning conference championships then. In 10 years, we were in the national scene. In the th next five years, the 15 years, we were uh, uh, the, the uh, village for the, the Olympics, the uh, Centennial Olympics. Yes, uh -huh. 1996. Yeah, and that was the thing too. On the Olympics, you were a uh, part of that. What, what did you do with the Olympics? I was a senior administrator for the camp, for the village. Uh -huh. Georgia Tech became the village, and that was an interesting time. Of, and very interesting putting all that together, as well as being director of athletics. Yeah, but you did that as as well as you were director of athletics. You were yes, doing that. I did both Olympics jobs. in the, exactly. in your spare time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Homer, they're giving us uh, signals. It's getting close to a break again. Uh, when we come back, I'd like to talk to you about your leadership program. You mentioned that was an integral part of your life and your success. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that, and we'll do that our next segment. Thank you, Joe. I'm one on Lucky Guy. The chance of being involved in a robbery is 1 in 757. The chances of being struck by lightning... 1 in 750,000. Please fasten your seatbelts for unexpected turbulence. The chances of being a victim in an airline crash? 1 in 29 million. 
Hey, could I get some peanuts? The chances of being involved in a car crash are far greater than lightning strikes and plane crashes. And if you are texting while driving, your risk of crash increases 23 times. Now, I may be an unlucky guy, but I don't have to be part of that statistic, and neither do you. Drive responsibly. Welcome to the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame with our guest Homer Rice. Homer, we were talking football before we left and promised we'd get into the leadership, but before we do, I'd like to clear up a question about the mythical champions in football. And in 1960, you were the actual first state champion in football. Could you explain how that all came about? Well, you're right. They were mythical champions in 57, 43, 1930 at Highlands. But uh, the playoff system began. In 1960, uh, we won uh, all our regular season games and then playoff games. And so we became the first official state champion. And uh, how that worked, they had at the time three divisions, Division One, Two, II, and Three. And we, uh, were, by enrollment, we're supposed to be in Division I. Uh, but uh, we were able to move up one, Division II. I wanted to go to Division Three to see if we were as good as people said we were. And that were all the Louisville schools, and, and uh, they wouldn't let us do that. But so I called Earl Cox, who was a writer in Louisville, that uh, knew all the high school teams well. And I called him, asked him, what are the best teams in the state? He said, I want to play every good team. He said, well, it's Ashland in the east, it's Bowling Green in the west, it's uh, Hazard in the southeast, it's uh, Lafayette in the central part, and of course in the northern part, the northeastern part, it's, uh, uh, it'd be Covenant Homes and your own team. And uh, he says in the top Louisville school, he said, you don't want to play them. They said, they're just too good. That's Louisville Mail. Well, I was able to schedule Mail. And uh, we played every other team that he mentioned, plus our own schedule. And uh, we won every game. We beat Mayo. And so that was a true state champion. We went through the playoffs and played Lex and Lafayette in the final game. And John Burden, Jim Burden, Roger Walls, and all that group became the first official state championship team in Highlands history. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, you, before we took our break, we were talking about uh, your leadership uh, program, would you like to start talking about that? Well, yes, I, uh, I, be, I started what was called the Total Person, Student Athlete Total Person Program. And the NCAA asked me to, uh, put me a chairman of committee, I went to Stanford University and uh, met with a group and, and we put together what was called the CHAMPS program, Challenging Athletes' Minds for Professional or Personal Success. I kept the word total person at our school at Georgia Tech. And that started a program that every school in America, over 200 schools, universities, uh, accepted this plan. And this is the leadership. And, and I began teaching this uh, to our student athletes. And then when I actually retired in 1997, the president asked me what I would consider being an adjunct professor and teaching this to all students at Georgia Tech. And I accepted that, and I did that, and I, so I was a football coach, then a director of athletics, and by the way, I'll be leaving here and going to Dallas to, to uh, <coughs> uh, present the Homer Rice Award to the top athletic director in Division 1A. So they named that in my honor. <coughs> but uh, I began teaching this course and, uh, of leadership to our student athletes, and of course then to uh, all students. And uh, that's the book, My Leadership Fitness book. Is a, the lessons in that are what I use to teach this course with. And that's became a, become a very excitable thing in our lives, our student. And, and I was even voted the most popular professor on campus. Uh, but I think the kids liked the course so much that it just meant a lot to them. Yeah. I remember uh, a couple years ago we had the... Uh sports exhibit up the Barringer Crawford Museum and you were kind enough to be the guest speaker for the opening of that and bought your book and signed copies and I read it and 
I just, my only regret it was that I didn't read it when I was 17 or 18 years old. I had to wait till I was 70 years old to read it. So. <laughs> but I understand now that this is the fourth update of this book. Yes, yeah, so it's the fourth update of this book. This is my seventh book. I first uh, wrote about the triple option offensive football. Three, three books on that, which put my three girls through college. And then uh, I started in the leadership thing and, and had books on that, Lessons for Leaders and others. And this is called Leadership Fitness. Are you fit to be a positive leader? And that's the that program that I work with at Georgia Tech. Yeah, that triple option, you're basically the inventor, the, the father of that. Well, I, I started to play in the, my first job in Wartburg and Spring City, and I did a lot of other offenses after that, but uh, I got back to it in college coaching and, and developed the passing game with it, and, and we were always a leading team in the country. And, an offense. And leading an offense. An yeah, offense. It's hard to yeah. stop. It is hard yeah. to stop. Yeah. yeah, you know what you're going to do. They, they got to guess. That's right. Yeah. Okay, your leadership, uh, I imagine you had, uh, outside of your seven books and your four updates, you've also had about 72 publications, articles, newspapers, magazines, and that published? Well, I think my uh, publisher said that uh, there's over 130, 130 there somewhere. Now. But uh, I just began writing early in life, and I just enjoyed doing it, and it was very interesting to me. <clears throat> You're keeping it up? You're not retiring? It's no, I'm 87, and uh, I've been working my whole life, and I don't see why we should stop now. I'm going to keep teaching this course, and I do a lot of other things. I've done it at Georgia Tech and other places. And I'll yeah. continue on. You're going to, going to keep doing it until you get it right, huh? That's right. I'm going to keep working on <laughs> yeah, it. A, a, uh, act in progress. Exactly. Uh, last year you won a major award. When I was talking to you for some other sporting event, or you said they were giving you some kind of an award in Atlanta. What was that? Well, that was the, um, actually that was a, my 14th Hall of Fame award. I have one here, and uh, that was my 14th. And, and there's a lot of other awards that, that I was fortunate because the good people I hired or good kids I coached, uh, they're responsible for all that. And uh, one award that I will receive in Louisville in January 2015 is called the Spirit of Giving Award. <clears throat> it's actually a new award that the, they will present to me there. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that because that's what my father first taught me, to be a giver. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I tried to do that throughout my lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, all your uh, many careers, you've always been basically, uh, as I said before on your introduction here, uh, you've described different uh, facets of your life. Uh, it's basically a teacher, an administrator, and I guess you enjoy doing each part of that. One of them doesn't supersede the other. And you're That's right. It, it, it focuses around young people. And I've worked with young people my entire life, and that we can put the put them out there as great citizens someday, and and make this a better world to live in. Yeah, and that student athlete program at Georgia Tech, you one of initiated that and started that, and yes. had all the success. With we it. were the first one to start the program in the NCAA, and that's when they asked me to NCAA to chair a committee to put all that together and. Yeah. And over 200 schools accepted and adopted that program. And yeah, so it started with you, and now there's over 200 major colleges yes. that's doing your program. That's correct. Do you yes. get any residuals from that? No, I don't accept or? anything. And <laughs> I don't accept anything as a teacher. It, it's my silent ministry, yeah. so to speak. Uh, so, but, uh, your uh, football record's outstanding, your coaching career. Uh, administration. You got anything you want to tell us about administration? I, one thing I always thought was mm -hmm. funny mm -hmm. about you was Homer Rice and being at Rice University. Did well, you tell them they named that school after you or what? Well, uh, I, they named the stadium Rice Stadium. I thought I better take this job. <laughs> <laughs> have a stadium already named for me. So, uh -huh. uh, uh, that was a, an interesting situation there. And uh, But I went to Bengals from there when Paul Brown called. and. Uh, that brought me back home, and I actually have been the only head coach of uh, high school and the college and pro t 
team in the same metropolitan area. There's yeah. no other one with this. Uh, it doesn't mean a lot, but it, it's interesting that uh, that would develop that way. Yeah, that's a trivia question. I came back home each that's time. That's a trivia question, yeah. Yes, it is a trivia uh -huh. question. They're the only one. Yeah, that was like the George uh, uh, Tom Thacker. It was a big trivia question. It was He's the only uh, basketball player that's played for an NCAA championship, the NBA championship, the ABA, and a CBA. He's the only player. Only and he's player. a local University of Cincinnati boy. From Covington. But, and he's won every championship and every class of yes. basketball. Exactly. National championship. He was a great player, a great yeah. person. Yeah, that, that trivia question, they could give you a lot of insight into mm -hmm. not only that person, but where they grew up and the activities and yes. like you see the great programs they had when Tom played there yes. and the education and everything. Uh, that Olympic Village intrigues me. Isn't that the one where they had the shooting? Uh, or was no, that, that was the uh, Centennial Park. <clears throat> Didn't have that at the Village. We, okay. we, but, I mean, was that was the same year though? Same year, yes. Same year, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I was the uh, the senior administrator for that program. That, that, and it was an interesting thing because I met with the, the police of the world police on all the security measures that had to be taken and I heard the name of Bin Laden at that time. Mm -hmm. And of course it didn't mean anything at that time but uh, uh, it later did but uh, uh, they were tracking at least three or four terrorist groups. Mm. And that was 1996, yeah. and they felt like there was a good chance that one might attempt something on the village since that was the first time we had all sports in one place. All the athletes were in one place. We had 15,000 athletes in our, in our village there. We had a double-wired electric fence. We had the, the helicopters above. They had Marines around, and it was... a a little bit scary, but it all worked out. We didn't have any problems with the village at all. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, was a good time. It's too bad they had the one tragic incident. Yes. But uh, I have to think we only have a few minutes left in this segment. I like to uh, your national committees you served on. Uh, well, I was uh, on the NCAA television committee. Uh, I served on hundreds of committees, I guess, and I was chairman of quite a few. And I was chairman of the football playing rules committee, and uh, I had nothing to do with what's going on today. But uh, yeah, I did. I, it was during my time when we started the the two points uh, extra point, and also the, the where the defense the extra point was the only play where the defense couldn't return a kick or punt or whatever or interception. But if they did and ran it back, we gave them two points. So that was why during my time, but. A lot of real changes during that period of time. Yeah, they uh, out of the, all of the committees you served on, which one did you enjoy the most? That you had the most camaraderie and. Well, I, I like the TV committee, which we no longer have. But we just think now we only had 13 games a year then, 12 to 13, 14 games, and we later started the, uh, the division of uh, having two national games one one day, and uh, split nationals we call them. And uh, I was the, kind of the chairman, or the sub-chairman I might be, of the, the negotiating committee. And I'd go up, we only had the networks at the time, CBS, NBC, ABC. And I would go up to, um, to New York <clears throat> and meet with these people. It scared me to death because I knew nothing about negotiating the contract, which we wouldn't do it there. I'd just bring the information back. <clears throat> but ABC won. The information, and if we have time, I have a story I like to tell you about uh, at Georgia Tech when I w arrived there. Uh, we did not; we were broke and needed money, and uh, and we just didn't know how we we're going to get it. And I called Rune Arledge, who had won the contract at ABC, which I had quite a bit to do with, and I said, Rune, I'd like for you to televise our Georgia game. He said, Coach. You got to be kidding! He says you're 0 and 9, and Georgia's 9 and 0. They're going to be playing, I think it was Penn State in the Sugar Bowl for the national title, and and he kept on. I just listened. He said, "I'll get back to you." And actually, we were in debt $354,000 at the time, which was quite a bit of money at that time. 
So he called back in a couple weeks. He said, how much money do you need? I said, 354000 He says, you got it. We got beat real bad, but at least we got out of debt and started the program and went on from there. Yeah, save, save the program. Save the program. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, we're getting a signal now to wrap up this segment, and we'll return shortly with our guest, Homer Rice. Hey Cam, thanks a lot for coming to my school today. Don't forget 60 minutes of play a day, right? And I'll grow up to be big and strong like you. Absolutely. And play in the NFL. Yes, sir. And become the starting quarterback of the Panthers. <laughs> okay. And become your mom's favorite player. Whoa. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> or am I? Welcome back to the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame show with our guest, Homer Rice. Homer, I'd like to know what the name Homer in football means to you. Well, uh, at Highlands High School, the first was a mythical state champion. Homer Jackson was the coach. That was the first state championship claimed for Highlands High School. And the next one was 1943, this symbol right here, that was coached by Yule Judge Waddell, and I was his player, quarterback, captain, all state in my next year and everything with him. And then the next state champion mythical was 1957, that was my team. And then from there, 1960, uh, my team, 1960, where I had John Burt and Jim Burt and Roger Walls and that group, we won the first official state champion. The state playoffs began in the Kentucky High School Athletic Association. And we won that in 1960, again in 1961, and then I left, of course, for the University of Kentucky. Yeah, so Homer <clears throat> resonates pretty good around Highlands. Well, look, we can say it was a start Yeah, <laughs> championship football. Yeah, some of the other coaches here at Highlands, uh, I'm sure you recognize some of them. Roger Walsh, you mentioned, was a player of yours, coach. Yes. Uh, Mike Murphy, uh, Owen Houck. Owen was my best assistant I've ever had in any place. He was, in fact, we were like uh, co-coaches in a way because uh, we, uh, we just worked together. We, there were just two of us in the beginning, and we did add others later on, but we, we started the program and worked it all out together, and... Uh, he, Owen is the type of person could gone anywhere. He'd gone in the collegiate world, the press, professional world, and been successful. But he stayed in the high school ranks, and and I, I admire him for doing that. Yeah, yeah, he was very successful at Highlands and Boone County. That's and, it. Uh, exactly. He was a very successful coach. Uh, of course, uh, you uh, have to uh, talk about the current coach, Dale Mueller. The great job he's done. Well, he took it to a new level, another yeah. level. Uh -huh. Unbelievable. I think he's won maybe 20 he's, state champions. Yeah, something, something like, like that, that yeah. or more. And they, last year they got people at one point, last couple of minutes or something, or something he'd, he'd like have won that, it again. But, but uh, uh, if he didn't retire, he would he'd keep going. He'd on all the records. He just stay, the records. But he is, he is an absolute. I witnessed the game. In fact, it was the 50th anniversary of our football, and uh, he actually won the game 40, 50 to nothing in their state championship game. <laughs> I thought that was neat. Yeah. But uh, I thought I'd never seen a well, better well-coached, synchronized team. As they, even, they looked good even warming up. Just, yeah. They had everything so uh, technical and set, and uh, he just did a tremendous job at times. Yeah. And, well, the good thing about it, too, was he was a homegrown boy. He, exactly. He went to Highlands, played at Highlands, came back. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, Bill Herman, he was another one of my assistants at, at state championship teams. And, uh -huh. and uh, of course, Roger, a player, had state championship teams. Of course, Owen, my top assistant I ever had, uh, one after I left, he stayed and coached, uh, had championship teams. And so it, uh, 
there's a lot of great coaches at Highlands that are homegrown. And oh, yeah. They're on the staff there to start with. Yeah. I'll show you these pictures, and then you can talk a little bit about them. This is a picture of you and Mike Brown when you were coaching the Bengals. Well, that's Paul Brown. Or Paul Brown, yes. And me. actually, uh, I met Paul through Mike Brown, who was 10 years old. I was at the at Great Lakes Naval Station. I just started 17 years old. I was in the Navy during World War II, and I was only there a short time. But... I was on the baseball team with Bob Feller, who is our manager, and uh, they were practicing, and I asked Mike the bat boy, he was the bat boy for our baseball team, I asked him if he'd take me over and meet his father, and he did, and, and Blanton Collier was there. Blanton knew all about me, he says, that young man was an all-state quarterback at Highlands High School, and he knew all about me, and uh, so I met both Blanton and, uh, and Paul, and they both were my mentors in coaching as years went on. And they both had offered me jobs uh, early on, but uh, I stayed in the college work for, and then uh, of course I did come back to when Paul called me to coach the Bengals. Yeah, so, I guess you're down in Atlanta now, but you heard uh, most people up here know about the story about the steal a football player that Mike Brown. Uh, they were going to have to cut him the last. Uh, day of this team, they put him on a taxi squad because yes. this kid had cancer to keep his insurance going. Exactly, a great and then, then he came back last week and he played and he made two or three tackles and that's, that's a good story. That, that is a great story. Yeah, it certainly. Is. A lot of times these owners don't get credit for a lot that's of the right. other stuff that they do. That's right. What's this picture, Ruffin? What's well, I'm 70 mind? years old there. I'm 87 now, <clears throat> and uh, I'm retiring as director of athletics at Georgia Tech. But after that, I became an adjunct professor, as I talked about before, to teach a leadership program to all students on Georgia Tech. They, the president could see the, the effect it had on our student athletes and the leaders they became from that program. And uh, so it was a great old man. I retired just as an athletic director, but I stayed on and been still working there now at age 87. Yeah. And you told us a story off camera about the adjutant professor. Your wife wanted to know what that meant. You yes. didn't know? Well, the, the, uh, I went home and told my beautiful wife, Phyllis, that, honey, I said, I've been a football coach, a director of athletics, and now I'm an adjunct professor. She said, well, what does that mean, an adjunct? I said, I don't know. She said, call the dean and find out. I called the dean. He said, it means we don't pay you. <laughs> so that's an adjunct professor in case anybody wanted to know. Yeah. But anyway, that was not a part of it. I just uh, I, I, I accepted that and was very happy doing it. Yeah. Okay, and this picture here is another part of your career where you were actually good enough to be a catcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers in this well, minor league team. Well, I, I could have been a, a good baseball player, but I didn't focus my attention on it as much as I did football. Uh, I also played basketball, and I was a track sprinter, and uh, did everything as was a sport, I was involved with it. And uh, that was a very interesting time, because Jackie Robinson was breaking in at the same time, and, and I knew there was something different when he, and there was another Afro-American player, Johnny Wright, W-R-I-G-T, was a pitcher. And then Bankhead came in later in, after the first season. Uh, and then Roy Campanella, who, it was one of the greatest catchers of all time in, in the baseball. But that was an interesting time. We're in Vera Beach there, that picture, and Frank Rickey, who's Branch Rickey's brother, was had an interest in me, and, and I told him I wanted to finish college. He says, that's fine, and we'll see how it goes, and we'll find a place where you play this summer, which he did. And uh, then he said, we'll talk to you about when you finish college, we'll talk to you about, about coming to Ebbets Field. So, that was a history of my baseball, but I entered the football coaching field instead. Yeah. The Dodgers at the time had some great baseball players. They won the National League for, what, about yeah. six or seven straight years? Exactly. An interesting thing, Pee Wee Reese, our shortstop and captain of the team, uh, I was a quarterback at, at, in some All-American honors at Center College, and the center married Pee Wee's sister. So hmm. we would talk about that uh, when I was with the Dodgers. A great person, and of course, Gil Hodges and all those great guys that played there were just wonderful. Yeah, and Pee Wee was, he's from around Louisville, wasn't he? He's from Louisville, Louisville yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought he was. Yes. Uh -huh. 
Uh, and this here is, like it says, the Total Person Program. Uh, Homer Rice Center for Sports Performance, Bobby Dodway, Atlanta, Georgia. I guess this was a flyer for one year. Yes, they, they put that in a building with my name on it, and they had to declare me legally dead because you had to be dead before they could name a building for you. <laughs> so I was dead for a short moment there. But uh, that's the tells about the total person program that we have for the student athletes and how it was developed and and all the things involved with it, which was we had people from all over the country come time and time again to see this and to accept it and take it to their own schools. Hmm. That's great. And this here is, uh, was it, this an oil painting of you? It is and they have that, uh, it's one I have a hard time seeing because it's, for some reason I just don't want to look at it, but uh, uh, it's a, an oil painting that a lady did and it's in the uh, the uh, uh, trophy room at, at uh, Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. and it's there with some history of my being there. And this is a really great article. I read this. The man who taught Tech how to win. The Ramblin' Wreck needed an overhaul and fast enter Homer Rice. Well, the key to that was I was able to hire really great coaches and good people to, to work with me in the administration. And together we were able to bring us out of, the, uh, uh, just think of this, we joined the Atlantic Coast Conference, we're in last place in every sport. And not only last, but in, like in football and some basketball, we'd get beat you know, many, many points in each game. And we went from a five-year plan to be in the top school in the ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference, and then the next five-year plan, we were national champions and going into the national rankings, and, and uh, we had at one time three sports ranked number one in the nation, and then the following five years were in the Olympics, yeah. uh, international. Yeah, and like I said before, <coughs> you're too modest to take credit for it. Along the way, a lot of the teams that were non-revenue sports were about to be cut and you resurrected the programs where they, they still kept them, kept the scholarships. Yes. A lot of people got educations because of your programs here. I was very fortunate to receive a tremendous gift from a lady named Lee Candler. And the Candlers were, of course, a big Coca-Cola people in Atlanta. And she made a gift of $50.5 million hmm. for my programs, which uh, is still the largest gift in the history of Georgia Tech. and that. That paved the way for us to, to have what we needed to supply all our sports. Yeah. And then the other one here, you got the, the Churchman Sports Review. This is back in 1974. Football innovator. Rice's career is one of achievements. Well, that was the uh, International Churchman's Sports Hall of Fame or something like that. And they wrote the article about that. and. Uh, I was at North Carolina. I just left University of Cincinnati and was at North Carolina's director of athletics at the time. Okay. Basically, this sums up your career. At every place you've won, went to, you've won and you've achieved. But not only did you achieve, you've done it with class and honesty and great integrity. And mm -hmm. they're sort of giving us the wrap up signal. So is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? When, Joe, I'm just excited about what you're doing with the North Kentucky Hall of Fame, the museum, and all that's, that's involved. In, and uh, I'm just glad to be a small part of it. And thank yeah. you. Well, glad to see you back in Northern Kentucky. Thank you, sir. And it's time to wrap up another segment of the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame that highlights the sports history of Northern Kentucky. And we'd like to thank our guest, Homer Rice, for appearing on the show. Thank you, Homer. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure.